Again, Dr. Lois Tiffany from the Botany and Plant Pathology Department, and I are down in Pamel Woods, and this is the same tree that we were talking of, about the last time, and we had some more to say about it, because right. we were talking at that particular time uh, of, the op of the leaves being opposite and the type of leaf and one whole... This is, this is one whole leaf, isn't That's it? That's right, one entire leaf. Right. But there are some other things that you don't have to necessarily have those leaves on that you should be, that you could see that even if it were wintertime. Right. Now, if we go back to this branch here where we broke one leaf off to take a look at it a little more carefully, you can see that there's a nice, neat break area here. Mm -hmm. And this is where this leaf would have, that leaf would have fallen off this autumn. Now, this is called a leaf scar, obviously enough, and you can see the little bud right there just above the leaf scar. And it'll be bigger by next fall, but not much so. Now, if you look back here on the older part of this branch, if we get back into last, well, this is two-year-old area we're in here, actually. But you can see here's a leaf scar from last, from two years ago. And here, even better, on this branch that grew last year, you can see these great big leaf scars. Mm -hmm. And so, in the winter even, you can see that there are two leaf scars here opposite each other. So this opposite and alternate business one can check out not only when the leaves are in, on the tree, but via the leaf scars you can tell where they were in the winter time. So this is a good, good character um, to use any time of year actually. All right, now big question. Why does that little branch go off there? Why, why does a branch go off? Or twig or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> because that particular bud grew. Now, oh, okay. <laughs> many, many trees uh, have what we call apical dominance. And an end bud will grow, and the lateral buds, the ones back along the side, will remain dormant. But if uh, the top gets broken off, say if we cut this one off here, this bud, which is right here at this node by this leaf scar, would probably go ahead and grow, if not mm -hmm. this year, next year. So when you prune shrubbery uh, in the yard or something like this, you prune the ends off, and then the, the buds that normally wouldn't have grown otherwise will go ahead and develop. Well, now this one wasn't pruned, though. No, this one wasn't pruned. So this so is just what happened? This is just natural. Something <laughs> happened to uh, uh, this one. Didn't, the one on this side didn't develop, and this one did. Uh-huh. <laughs> and you notice there are lots of places back here along the, the where, see there are a pair of buds here, right. there's a pair of buds here, and, now, the, and none of these have developed. Now this has pretty uh, distinct uh, growth areas. Right. This. Now the very green uh, branches right here are this year's growth. And yeah, did we say what kind this was? It's an ash. <laughs> yes. <okay. laughs> All right. Um, the flecks here on this stem are called lenticels. And these are little corky areas, which uh, permit the, the passage of gases from the cells inside the stem to the outside air and outside air gases into the stem. And you'll notice they look different here. Mm -hmm. You can still see them back here on the older branches also. Now, does insect problem uh, cause it not to grow as much? This would depend on the insect and on the particular plant. This would vary with different combinations. Well, now, one thing I wanted to, for us to go to this, because we were talking about, and I, not what it is particularly, but you said that this, this is the, what, effect of an insect? Right. This is where an insect has actually eaten out the, the green cells of the leaf. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, and these are the, the green cells are the ones that make the food for the tree, so when they're eaten, uh, if, an, if enough insects ate enough green cells, then this tree would be in trouble. Mm -hmm. Now, another funny little one here. Where did it go? Did I step on it? This leaf right here, I think, is the one you were looking at. Yes, now that, that looks like, you know, a little spider went by and left a little web. Now, I'm not an entomologist, right? but I think this is caused by an insect that's called a leaf miner. And it, it tunnels, actually, through, this, through, through the leaf and eats out, again, the green cells. And so you see the little trails uh, where it's journeyed through the central part of the leaf. Now, um, as I said, I may be asking something that I shouldn't be asking you, but um, as it goes from here across this main vein, now, did that cut off any of the food um, the traveling down to this vein and back? Uh, maybe, maybe not. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know really how... Um, my impression is that they just eat the, 
the green cells, which are relatively thin-walled cells, mm -hmm. and the cells which uh, actually transport materials are fairly thick-walled. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, I'm, I'm talking about something I don't know a lot about. <laughs> <laughs> now, as far as other trees, this is, this, wait, this is a puny one. <laughs> this is a puny one, but it's one that um, is of interest. We were talking about poison ivy. Right. And this that was last time. That was last time. And we were pointing out that poison ivy has three leaflets mm -hmm. in each leaf. Well, this is a box elder, and it grows in the same kind of places poison ivy does frequently. And when you see this as a seedling tree with its three leaflets in each leaf, it sometimes can look very much like poison ivy. The edges of the leaf are, are cut in very much the same way. So now, does the box elder end up with the three leaves? Uh, some box elders have three leaflets on each leaf, uh -huh. as you can see this plant does fairly consistently. Some of them will have some threes, some leaves that have three leaflets, uh -huh. and some leaves that have five leaflets. And so that there is no... There just, yeah. This is just natural, natural. variation. Yeah. But it does, I can definitely see yeah. why it would resemble yeah. the poison ivy. Now, one of uh -huh. the interesting things about box elder, it's sort of a scrawny tree. Uh, you and mean this one is or all box elders? Often they are. Uh, but it, it, you notice it has opposite mm -hmm. uh, leaves here again. And it is actually in the maple group of, of plants. But it's the only maple that we have in this part of the world, or in this, at least in the Midwest here, that has a compound leaf. All of our maples, both hard uh -huh. maples and soft maples, have simple leaves, like uh -huh. the ones we've talked right. about before. So this uh, is, is a, a peculiar maple. Now, as I say, this, this is one that looks like poison ivy when it's small. But now, we were talking about how poison ivy can grow, and it's not always on the ground. And this tree is a good example of how it can go up. Well, right. Now, let's see if we can get it from the bottom. Now, the, uh, the vine that you can see growing up uh, that oak tree there is actually a Virginia creeper vine. But mm -hmm. if That's we a little five leaf one. Right. But if we couldn't see the, the leaves on it right now, the vine itself, the stem growing up there, looks very much like a, a poison ivy vine. And grapevines, obviously, out in the woods look very much like this also. And don't use them to... <laughs> don't use them to swing on, no. Right. Will you get the poison ivy from the bark? Or does it have to be from the leaf? Or do you know? You can, you can get it from any part of the plant, even the roots. Mm -hmm. But uh, you have to come actually into, into contact with it. I mean, just walking by the tree right. or something like this would not be a problem. But contact with the roots or with the, the With bark. the stem or with the leaves, yeah. right. And uh, this has to, again, finish this section at least. And our guest has been, again, Dr. Lois Tiffany from the Botany Plant Pathology Department. And maybe the next time we'll go on campus on some of the unusual trees. Fine. Thank you. Again, we have with us Dr. Lois Tiffany of Botany and Plant Pathology. And the last time we were talking in the woods, we promised that we'd talk more about leaves. <laughs> but we've, we have discovered a leaf here that we better talk about first. We're going to getting poison ivy, we think. Now, the leaves over there, I think, are the ones that cause a lot of mothers and children to wonder if it's poison ivy. Now, that is or is not poison ivy? This is not. And this one, you see, has five leaflets. Mm -hmm. They're all attached at one common point here onto a petiole, onto a stem which goes down to the main stem. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not going to pick the poison ivy like that, <laughs> but it has three leaflets with, which are attached in the same way, coming into a common point, and the, the edges are, are very similar on mm -hmm. the two. But uh, this business of three and five is quite uh, significant. Now, both of these plants, both Virginia creeper with the five leaflets and poison ivy with the three, will be on the forest floor like this, crawling along, growing along. Uh, they may occur as vines growing up on houses or on trees, or they may look like short shrubs, uh, somewhat upright, maybe to anywhere between two and four feet high. So both the Virginia creeper and the poison ivy plant are alike in growth habit, uh, and they both obviously occur in the same kind of habitat, same kind of places. Now, I noticed that you were quite willing, and I'll be daring enough to get a finger this close, but now, um, actually, is it poisonous if you don't... Uh, uh, touch it, or is that debatable, depending upon the sensitivity of the person? 
usually you have to actually come in contact with it, except when you have uh, poison ivy material that is in a fire. If you're uh, having a, a picnic fire somewhere or clearing an area in the woods, if you get uh, poison ivy material, then the compound that people are sensitive to is volatile and it will be in the smoke. Ah, so, so that perhaps is so the way this is done. one way people can contact it without actually touching the plant. Mm -hmm. Well, now on to other leaves, but just be careful about this one. <laughs> we'll watch this one. <laughs> now this leaf is, I think, a different tree, but it has some of the same uh, sort of edge as one of the trees the other day. Right. It looks very much like the um, both the ironwood uh, and the uh, hackberry that we were talking about the other day, and it has the same kind of leaf in that it is a simple leaf, uh, one flat green part, one petiole, and when we take a look at the stem here, there is a leaf here, a leaf here, one at each node, uh -huh. one at each point on the stem. So, and we said that there are plants where there is, um, there are two leaves attached at one point here. So we just, we'll start from this one again, and then this is basswood, incidentally. Mm -hmm. um, it's called uh, also uh, linden tree. Oh, these are two the names same for the same the tree. same tree, and it has um, a, it's a uh, very common uh, tree in the, in the slopes here in the woods, and often grows. You can see there are two trunks there in a cluster, and these are actually coming from the same root system, and often you'll see different size trunks uh, coming up from the same root system. So you get what look like a whole cluster of trees, but they're actually part of the same one. So this this doesn't branch after it once has a central uh, trunk, like some of the trees that may go up and then have their branches. That actually right. it almost branches from the root system. Almost, and this is one of the things that makes it perhaps uh, a little more difficult in terms of uh, lawn yeah. trees and things of this sort. All right, now maybe this was on the other, and I didn't get it. That little, the little green bump. fella there, yes. that little green bump is the bud. Now this will be uh, where next year's leaves and stem would come from. And by, the, by this fall, this one, which is bright green right now, will be a sort of a, a coral pink color. And so the winter buds, or when the, when the buds go into winter, they are actually a sort of a bright red. And they're very handsome. Oh. Uh -huh. But it's, it's much more prominent on this. It, it shows much better on then, this tree. Right? Now, is that unique for this tree, or is it just the time of the year? Uh, they're a little older than when we were looking mm -hmm. at them last. And also, this one has bigger buds. Mm -hmm. So it's got two things going for it. All right. All right. Now, with this one in mind, let's move over here and take a look at this maple. Now, this one's this one is different. This one is different. This is uh, one of the maples. This is so-called hard maple, and as you can see, at each node back here on the stem, there are two leaves. Two here coming off in this plane. Two here, and the the basal part of the petiole here tends to to sort of sheath around the stem, sort of encloses it much more than the other things we were looking at. Mm -hmm. And you'll notice the leaf itself is a very different pattern. It has each one of these big areas here is called a lobe. And so this individual, this is a still a simple leaf, but each the leaf has three lobes on this particular one we're looking at. And it doesn't have one big central uh, vein. That's right. We can see this perhaps Oops, a little better. That's our little friend. <laughs> see this better on the reverse side of the leaf here. You can see that there are are three large veins. In fact, there are a couple of ones which almost qualify as being as big, uh, rather than having one main midrib vein as on the leaves we've been looking at before. So the vein pattern is quite different too and is characteristic of this particular kind of tree. Here again, this hard maple and the bass would be, would be trees which we'd commonly find on slopes here in central part of Iowa, like uh, the woods we're here in here today. Now, now one other thing before mm -hmm. we go to the other, though. Okay. Now, uh, on the other, we had the little buds, but now this doesn't have nearly the prominent buds that the other one did, and uh, it's exactly the same time of the year. Okay. Now this one, they're, they're down in there, and if we took the broke the petiole back, we could see them nestled right in here where the petiole attaches onto the stem, mm -hmm. but. Uh, they, they haven't developed nearly as much. Mm -hmm. They won't be as big by next fall either. Now, beginning right here is this year's growth. Okay, isn't it? right. This much stem is this year's growth. How much do they usually grow a year? Or does it, this it, it varies a great deal on individual trees and on different parts of the same tree. Mm -hmm. This is down here in the shade, so I'm sure if we 
you know, if we climbed up to the top of the tree, we could find some that were much larger even. Is that a disease? That's an insect. Now these are opposites, but now right. that, that one right there has opposites too, and they look a little bit different. All right, let's get it down here. Oops. Now, you're right. You can see on the branches here, maybe we can see it on this one very nicely. There are two leaves here, two here, two here. Mm -hmm. And, but this much is one leaf on this. Right, and this much is one leaf here. Right. And you can see, they're, here again, they're small, but there's a bud right down there. And this is the way we tell that this much, I'll break this one off so we can take a look at it, is one entire leaf. Mm -hmm. Now, this is the, the petiole still, but each one of these flat green parts, which are separate, would be individual leaflets. Mm -hmm. So this is a so-called compound leaf because it has more than one flat green part. And more than that, it's called a pinnately compound leaf because there are leaflets attached here, here, and here. So they're attached at different places on the stem. Now these are all important term, uh, terms if you're going to be looking up in the, in the tree book for identification and this sort of thing. Right. One of the first things uh, a tree book will, will ask you about in terms of the plant you're looking at is whether it has simple or compound leaves. Uh -huh. And so this is uh, one, of the, one of the beginning steps. If you miss that step, you, you, you had a bad, you, you had a wrong spot. Right. And we'll have to get the details of, of, of that particular type of tree at another time. Our guest has been Dr. Uh, Lois Tiffany with the Botany Plant Pathology Department at Iowa State, and we will continue perhaps another day.